Hey guys, you're listening to episode 185 of The Modern Acre. This week, we are talking to the co-founder and CEO of Benson Hill. Benson Hill is part of the plant-based movement and industry, and they're focused on the the seed breeding genetic side of the equation, um, working with farmers, but food companies as well. And so we really get into that side of the plant-based industry. You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. So Ty, it's been a couple of weeks since we last did Parenting Corners. Just wanted to check in and see how things were going. I know you have a lot going on with the house remodel, two girls under the age of three. You're just a busy guy. What's the latest over there? Well, I would say that the last week has probably been one of the most exhausting weeks of fatherhood. We decided to finally pull the trigger and potty train my oldest daughter, who is uh, two and a half going on three. And so we took the whole last weekend to just stay at home and go try to do potty training in three days situation, just kind of rip the bandaid, so to speak. And basically you just sit at home and you um, stare at your daughter and make sure she doesn't have accidents and gently guide her and encourage her in the direction of the potty. And it is the most exhausting, worst way to spend a weekend because you're stuck inside and there is no relaxation. It is just on watch, on call the whole time. So I'm pretty exhausted. And then we just just decided, you know, life was not busy enough that we wanted to also do swim lessons um, around the same time. The swim lessons, for what it's worth, we had to book out like six months in advance. Um, It's like this guru guy that gets your kid water safe in two weeks. And it's like foolproof. And otherwise, you, you get your money back. So we did that as well. So we were like potty training. But then we were also taking her up to North County, San Diego once a day for two weeks to do this swim training. And all in all, she's crushed it, been awesome. There's been a few accidents. I have had to clean up number two in some areas that I would really prefer not to. Um, It's all part of the job, Tim. I'm really looking forward to you uh, experiencing this soon. Wow, Ty, it sounds like you've got a lot going on there. I would have recommended waiting to do the potty training until football season hits. So at least you can watch college football on Saturday, pro on, on Sunday, like you mm. got to wait for the season to start. I think that would have been a good call. So I think I'm going to take that approach with uh, with baby girl when she's ready for that. Or you'll be distracted by the football and she will go in her diaper or in her underwear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's probably high likelihood. Rookie, rookie mistake. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What's going on oh, uh, as you prepare for for the baby? Prepping for babies, so knocking out some projects in the nursery, getting the the monitor all set up, got the crib built, everything's pretty much ready to go there. I did a, a soft drive by the hospital on Friday afternoon, so just to kind of check out the route to the hospital, check out where the parking situation is going to be. So, um, getting getting pretty dialed in. the uh, The most recent one though has been kind of prepping and understanding how to introduce a uh, dog to a baby. So there's a couple good Instagram follows that we've been tracking and listening to some podcasts, but I think, uh, I think whiskey will be good meeting her, her little sister here in a couple, in a few weeks. Totally. No, whiskey's done great around our, our little girl. So that's kind of her, uh, her first pass at it. But, uh, I think, I think she'll be great with the baby, but, oh man, Tim, uh, I'm, I'm excited for you. It's going to be fun. Well, guys, excited to get into this episode. We are talking to Matt Crisp, and Matt is a former venture capitalist and turned founder and has been growing Benson Hill to be really one of the uh, companies that are a little bit more behind the scenes of the plant-based movement. They're focused on really developing ingredients for the plant-based movement that are sustainably made and, and real foods. I think we mentioned this in the podcast, but Tim and I have talked about some of our concerns with the plant-based movement 
the three that come to mind is one is taste. Can can it be can it deliver a equal or superior product? Two is the ingredients having clean ingredients, or is it made up of of subpar ingredients? And three, which ties into number two, is just the amount of processing that's required, right? And so uh, we really dig into that a bit on this podcast, which I think is really interesting and, and makes me just more bullish on the the plant-based industry. If, if we can figure out some of these ingredient side problems and challenges, then I think there's a lot bigger opportunity in my opinion. Yeah, it's a really fun conversation with with Matt. We get into the background of uh, the SPAC deal that they did several months back and also into their their business model, which is really interesting, kind of a two-sided model working um, both with the farmers as customers and also with CPG and plant-based companies as, as customers on the other side. So really interesting go-to-market and platform that they're developing. It's a, a super good episode, so let's get into it. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Yeah, thank you guys uh, for having me. Yeah, we're super excited to talk to you and about your work with with Benson Hill. But before we do, we were, we were chatting a little bit earlier about the industry and segment that you're focused on, which is plant-based and some recent updated projections, kind of forecasting where they see the space the next few years. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I've seen three alerts in the last week where we've got this uh, astronomical growth rate in the plant-based category, and and this has been published for plant-based, plant-based uh, uh, meat and dairy alternatives, you know, general market research around the, the trajectory, the arc of growth. And I've seen three alerts in the last week around new market research that's getting published saying that uh, perhaps advanced, you know, faster by the pandemic, but that we're actually looking at a rate of adoption uh, in this category, even higher than the projections that have been put out over the last 12 to 24 months. So, I mean, any industry that's growing at a rate already of between 25 and 40 percent CAGR, um, and now these projections are coming out saying that in the next five to 10 years, it's going to go even faster than that. Uh, I mean, I'd, it's kind of jaw dropping when you think about it. And, and I wonder if we really if we really, truly appreciate how fast this trend is moving. Totally. No, I think that I think that's really interesting that you mentioned that and obviously very important for you and your company about those trends. And I mean, I think it's something that we're following closely. And there's there's seems just like there's a ton of players and there's a new plant based company um, every week, it seems like that is, is coming to market. And so we're really excited to get your opinion and perspective on the industry, especially because you're, you're playing a little different role in the value chain, which I think is interesting. So take us back to the beginning of uh, maybe a little bit about your background and what ultimately led you uh, to Benson Hill. Yeah, sure. So I, I spent the first part of my career in venture capital and uh, investing principally in the in the life sciences arena. I'm a, I'm a generalist, so uh, I don't come from food and agriculture. I really fell in love with it uh, about 10 years ago, um, primarily because, it, you know, I had this unique opportunity to see lots of different innovations across a lot of different companies using a lot of different enabling tech um, but mostly for human health care. And, and when you toggle over to food and ag and you start to look around for people leveraging the same types of approaches, um, it's actually uh, it's disheartening, I mean, to, to see the lack of innovation. I think, um, you know, embracing biology um, and, and uh, using computational approaches and human intelligence and the convergence of those two to advance the food system is something that has, has sort of been behind the the, the heavy closed doors of, you know, very few companies focused on very few crops for a long, long time. And, and that's engendered this, um, you know, commodity system, which is incredibly, you know, uh, scalable and, 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 and we're really great, you know, best in the world at producing cheap calories. But um, it, 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 it impressed upon me that there was an opportunity to build an organization um, that, could focus on some of the challenges that would be good for our planet and ultimately good for the consumer as well that weren't weren't in the in the focal region of, of some, some of these really big guys and so in 2012 uh, co-founded Benson Hill uh, we're based here in, in St. Louis in the Midwest and um, and we've grown from you know a scrappy group of a handful of people to 350 people and um, have raised over a quarter billion dollars over the last nine years and built 
an organization that's uh, integrated, that's um, very much centered around technology and technology innovation. Our, our technology platform, which we call Crop OS, short for Crop Operating System, but that's that's dedicated really to advancing uh, seed and improving seed, at making um, the seed in our crops better from the beginning, such that we can improve the food and ingredients that come from those crops. Um, and when I say improve, it's for those reasons. It's to make them more environmentally sustainable and 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 uh, you know able to produce in in a more resilient manner, given given what's going on climate change wise. Um, but also, you know, to impart societal benefit to um, to uh, to deliver more nutrient density, better taste and flavor, um, more you know, of course, more overarching sustainability, but really importantly as well, more affordability. Well, wow, what a what an awesome journey! I I read a blog post that you had you had penned recently, kind of making the analogy of of selling the the pickaxes and shovels within the plant based movement and kind of the gold rush that's happening, which I thought was super interesting. And wondered if you could maybe just dig a little deeper there and talk a little bit more about your business model of who who are your customers? Are you working with farmers directly or working and collaborating with actually plant-based CPG brands? Maybe talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Sure thing. So it's really the two you mentioned, I mean, and you hit it uh, really well. It's it's a bit of a two-sided business model, right? When I say we're an integrated organization, we're really linking these interests of growers with the interest of the consumer. And, And while we're a B2B company, and we're working, partnering with uh, uh, farmers to produce a crop in an identity preserved manner where we maintain that 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 crop um, uh, harvest. I mean, the, you know, the, the integrity of the crop and the ultimate products that are coming from it. But we're moving that through the value chain um, in an identity preserved manner so that we actually sell the ingredients or the food to the CPGs or the food system innovators, ingredient companies, uh, the retailers. Um, and in doing so, we're linking these interests. We're, I think we're, we're, we're as a company, um, set on delivering benefit to both sides of the equation, bringing value to both sides of the equation, but it's all enabled by the, the natural genetic diversity of plants, right? If we can harness this natural genetic diversity, if we can make seed better from the beginning, we can work with growers and give them a product that doesn't just produce great yield, but it also produces premium attributes. It has traits in it that the consumer values. And, and when that happens and we do, you know, do the heavy lifting of bringing it to our customers, those food companies and others um, who, by the way, might look at what we're providing them as, as, as an as good or better solution than what they can get elsewhere. Oh, but by the way, it's more sustainable and it's more affordable. Uh, and, and, and we can lift up, you know, both sides of this equation and still have a healthy margin in between. I mean, that's the excitement of what we do, but it, it really is built off of technology and, and using nature, you know, and, and, and the diversity it's provided us. I think it's super, super interesting. And I, I love what you guys are doing. It's, it's interesting that, you know, I think the knocks on plant-based are maybe the two, two of the bigger knocks, right? Are one is on maybe taste, right? Like getting to the, to the right form, whether it's meat or otherwise of the consistency, flavor, taste. And then two is, you know, the ingredient base, right? Like, are, mm-hmm. are you using natural ingredients? Are you using ingredients that are, that are good for you? Right. And I think you guys are actually hitting on, on both these and, and doing it in a more sustainable manner by improving the ingredients. I think you can hit on both of those quote unquote issues. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could hit on both of those for, for a minute longer here too. I mean, when you think about taste, right, why, why does the, why does it not taste as good? Well, it's usually because the base protein ingredient that went into that thing came out of the commodity system. I mean, I don't know if you ever had yellow pea protein, but if you do, I'm sorry. Like, it's just, it's beyond terrible. It, you know, so <laughs> what do you have to do to make that yellow pea protein palatable? Um, you got to add a, a lot of stuff to it. Well, actually, first, you got to process the heck out of it, right? Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to mention is the, pro- is the processing as well in it, which I think you're addressing too. Exactly, exactly. So, so you gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta add a lot of uh, junk to it, you know, maybe sodium or whatever. And that's why these labels on, on a lot of these products are quite long, but it doesn't, ha- they don't have to be right. Those flavors are coming from the crop. Um, the, the genotype and the environment in which it produced, it, it, it was produced is the reason why it tastes the way it tastes. 
Um, and so if we can go back to the beginning and we can eliminate breed for some of the better tasting material, which has not been a focal point for obvious reasons in the past, you know, because we've been breeding for yield to put stuff into a commodity system, um, then we can solve. Okay. Now I get to the other point, like you said, less process, but it's also more what you said a minute ago, more whole. So we've talked a lot about in society, whole foods. In fact, we have a big question, whole foods, right? Um, and so I think we, we as consumers have become uh, more informed and smarter that whole foods are better for you, but we don't often talk about whole ingredients, you know, and I, I think that's a whole different thing. It's an important thing. And so same exact um, procedure, right? Go back to the natural genetic diversity of the plant. Look at the, the the opportunity space that's there using technology. Breed for something that has the profile of what you want at the end game so that you don't have to process the heck out of it, right? So if I can enrich the protein content in a soybean upstream, and I don't, then I don't have to run it through these intensive processing steps that, you know, by the way, are super, uh, you know, energy and water intensive and expensive. I don't have to do as much of that in order to get a base protein ingredient that I can then go and, and, and make into a plant-based meat alternative, for instance. No, I, I love the model and the two-sided approach of really tying a premium input with a premium output and getting growers a differentiated channel to sell that product. When you're in a commodity market, it's very hard to differentiate. And by having better inputs and being able to offer that, it gives farmers more flexibility to go capture higher revenue for, for the crops they're growing. So I love that about your model. Matt, a lot of our audience um, is is big in the ag news, and you made news a couple months back about going public via SPAC. So, wondering if you could just talk us through the background there and your decision to go public. Yeah, sure. Um, so it was, gosh, I mean, eighteen months or so ago. It would have been late twenty nineteen, um, and uh, and we at the board uh, had a conversation about you know whether the public markets might make sense for Benson Hill in time. Um, and we we agreed that 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 they indeed may um, even put in place uh, a group to to take a look at as we called it at the time I believe a pre public market readiness right so so looking at the the sequence of steps that we would need to undertake administratively and otherwise to prepare ourselves um, which you know, that's a long list right and it takes not months but usually years of lead time um, and we began to put some resources against that. And then in the middle of last year, you know, it was pretty bumpy, obviously, 2020. Um, and and it, it, I think in part led to this, um, uh, you know, opening up of the SPAC market. Uh, we, we began to evaluate late last year again, you know, was this the right time? Is this, does this pose an opportunity for us to, um, you know, execute on another financing event? This is following our Series D we did last year as a $150 million round. Um, did, did, would, would a p p potential public market entry via SPAC um, be the right next move to form capital and, 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 and actually accelerate our growth? And in the fourth quarter last year, we got some really good data and some results. And that, that really, I think, helped solidify our decision that indeed, let's do this. Like the, the, there seems to be an opportunity um, going public via SPAC, you know, creates additional degrees of certainty around timing, around valuation, uh, around capital. And so, uh, and frankly, I think it, it helped management, you know, helps management get back to running the business, which we really need to do. Right. So, so we undertook a process early this year. Um, we had a lot of options and, and partners to go public with and ultimately uh, chose to partner with Star Peak uh, Corp 2, uh, traded now under STPC, and, um, and, and, and this has been a great partnership. I mean, um, we've been able to align with a group that's very much focused on sustainability, um, has the same set of values and, and what we as an organization believe needs to be introduced to advance the food system. Um, and, uh, and the process has, has gone smoothly I and mean, it's been a little bit bumpy in the markets, but you know, it's gone smoothly. We had an oversubscribed, uh, uh, upsized uh, pipe. Um, to $225 million to augment $400 million in trust. And, and you know, we're in, in, in dialogue with the SEC now. In fact, just filed our most recent S4 amendment a couple of days ago. Um, so we feel like we're on the, the downhill slope and still project to close uh, this quarter um, and, uh, and to be publicly traded on the NYSC under the tickle, ticker 
uh, B H I L, um, uh, here in the next few weeks. So it's exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah, that's really exciting times. And it totally makes sense, right? Like your how, how you're thinking about it. And the this SPAC, um, sometimes it gets some heat. But I think like, ultimately, it's a really good vehicle um, for companies in specific situations. And I mean, I think it makes a, a, a ton of sense. Um, so so cool to see that. Matt, I wanted to pivot a little bit and talk, dig in a little bit more about the business and the technology that you're building and the products that you're building. Maybe talk us through some of the challenges that you've faced uh, really growing and scaling the business. There's this um, phrase I, I reheard recently, and it's it's sort of like the each it, the the gist of it is that each time you triple as a business, things break. <laughs> or, or, you know, and I don't know if break is the right way to put it. I think that was someone's, uh, someone's, uh, um, the words that someone used, uh, to describe a similar phenomenon, but you think about it like this, you go from three people to 10 people and 10 people to 30 people and 30 to roughly a hundred. Right. Um, and now 300, right. So we've just sort of crossed that, 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 that chasm again. And, um, and, and I, I would say that that's a really good indicator of where, um, there's friction in a company's growth. You know, it's it's really a business that is 30 people. Um, everybody can know everything that's going on, right? It's super, super engaging, super collaborative. Everyone truly does, you know, um, does know everyone and, and knows about what's going on. You get to 100 people and um, now you've got more structure in place. Um, things are a little less flat. Uh, you get to, you know, hundreds of people. You've got systems and processes that are enabling you to scale and, and, you know, those are, those are challenges that I've seen in other businesses I'd worked with in my past. Um, and we're, we at Benson Hill aren't immune to those. What I would tell you is that culture, um, culture reigns, you know, I mean, people who have been here for five, six, seven years, um, you know, who are able to be leaders, no matter at what level they are in the organization to new folks who come in. And help and instill upon them a set of values that allows us to uh, be real. One of our three core values, right? Um, and to engage with one another in a manner that doesn't threaten folks, that gives people the license to fail, that allows us to learn and succeed together. These these have been the undercurrent that have allowed us, I think, to successfully execute against a lot of milestones. And and I'd tell you right now, as a business. Um, I get asked a lot, like what, what keeps me up at night? And um, the number one, you know, the, the number one thing that that's being underwritten in this uh, IPO we're undertaking right now and our business plans that we've published is execution. You know, our products that are in the market right now, um, we're really excited about, you know, we've got over a hundred million dollars of revenue. We're running a business uh, we're operating, but we've got to scale and scaling requires execution. So, We've left behind a lot of the technical risk as it relates to our current plan, and um, and 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 today it's just about getting stuff done. When you say that, and a synonymous word is is talent. You know, it's the, it's people, and so again, it sort of points back for me to culture and you know to working with great, very smart people who are collaborative and engaging, and who appreciate the degree at which we're you know we're we're advancing. Those are some super good insights. I really like the the points about kind of dealing with hyper growth and scaling up a company over a short amount of time and how you've you've managed that. Well, Matt, would love to get your perspective. You've been at this close to a, a decade now. Maybe talk to us about what you found to be most surprising or unexpected about this journey in the plant based world. Yeah. So what I I would tell you, look, coming from the outside, you know, I, I'm an outsider. F- to food nag. I, like, I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't spend the first part of my career in this category. Um, I, I'm endeared to this category. I'm in love with what we're doing uh, and why we're doing it. But a surprise is the, the degree to which I continue to see silos in, in this space. Um, the degree to which we have incentivized scale. Um, and, 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 and I think, forgotten at some level or never learned in the first place how to link up the stakeholders in the system that can, when collaborating with one another, actually have mutual gain. Um, so, so think um, seed companies to the farmer, to 
uh, a grain handler, a processor, an ingredient company, a food company, a retailer. I mean, this is a value chain where there's, you know, three or four different languages almost that seems like they're spoken. And, and so we use terms, I think, and this is in an opportunistic and, and more optimistic manner, like decommoditization. Um, sometimes we use terms uh, like niche and specialty. And, and what I think we, we've got to do um, is we've got to get over the idea that niche and specialty don't mean that it's going to be a thorn in my side. <laughs> you know, if I'm a farmer, farmers are speaking with us and are um, incredibly sophisticated forward thinking, and they're not, they're not scared of the, the opportunity that something today might not be tens of millions of acres, it might be tens of thousands of acres, but it's soon going to be hundreds of thousands and millions of acres. And those acres are going to be more profitable than what we've seen in the rearview mirror. And that creates a magnificent approach in a decommoditized system, um, you know, to, to unite, uh, uh, and I'm generalizing, the farmer with the consumer interest and, and to sort of punch through, you know, these, these, these uh, thick walls that have existed between the various silos in the system today. I've been surprised seeing that coming in, but, I've, but I'm really optimistic about where we're headed. I love that term of decommoditize. Uh, I, think that, I think that's great. I think it's Tim and I talk a lot, a lot about it on the podcast and think it's really important. Matt, I wanted to kind of wrap up this section, focusing in on the farmer um, and and kind of that relationship. Could you speak a little bit more to to what that relationship or dynamic looks like currently? Do you, are you working with producers that are, are growing these seeds, and maybe you can talk through in addition to that, kind of like the post processing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are we're, we we execute um, uh, programs with our our farmer partners last year. Uh, in soybean, we, we announced 30,000 acres. It was for the 2020 crop. Uh, this year, we just announced 70,000 acres of production, uh, which beat our goal. Our goal was to double um, from 30 to 60,000. So we're about 33% of our goal, really proud of the team for that. Um, and then, and then you know, working with those growers um, isn't just about production. It's about engagement and, and, and partnership. So we, we also just announced just last week our uh, Food System Innovator Program, um, FSI program, where there's an elite group of growers that we're very deeply engaged with on the data side and where we're swapping information. Um, we're collaborating with them on new program design. We're effectively trying to build the foundation for um, scalable, profit, more profitable outcomes for a wider base of growers where they're, they're in, in many respects, advisors um, and mentors to us. And, and, and we're collaborating and creating, I think, synergy and, 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 and you know, designing outcomes that um, should over time get, get farmers excited about advancing the food system and, and are. Um, so that's, that's a, a couple of layers about how we're engaging those farmers. It, once you look past the farm gain and processing and downstream, I would tell you that because we're linked to these folks, because we're in dialogue with customers and we're learning as well from them about what product specifications they want, um, what the consumer movements are, trends, you know, maybe fads that maybe, maybe in the future lead to trends. Um, we're linking those data and insights back as well into our technology platform, our breeding programs. So we're looking at, you know, new, this is a regular, you know, recurring theme, always um, new varieties, uh, new approaches to how we can develop better products. And then again, bringing those information back to growers, helping them help us test them and determine exactly how we might scale together. So it's a, it's a, it is indeed two-sided, but um, what I want to emphasize is that the relationship is not unilateral. It's it's really designed to be bilateral, and I'm excited about about working with these folks. Yeah, I love that initiative and the, the collaboration with the farmer of really getting the buy in and being on the journey together. I think is is super important as you as you ramp things up, and we're excited to how excited to see how you continue to grow over the next next year or so. We'll have to check back in in a year and see how things are are moving along. Yeah, I hope you guys do. It'll be fun. We should keep this up. Definitely. Well, Matt, we're going to switch gears here to a section we call Quick Takes. What ag product or service is needed but doesn't yet exist? Ooh, uh, that's a good one. Um, 
Uh, I think we need, this is a a shameless plug for this FSI program in a way, we've got to figure out a way to pay the grower for quality, period. If we can design a, a, we can call it a product or a service, but a system where we can pay the grower for quality, it will lead to win-win outcomes. What ad product or service isn't needed, but is still being pushed? (laughs) Uh, I would, I might suggest that the precision ag, uh, uh, hype is on a downward slope, maybe to come upward later, but we've, we've sort of psych done a hype cycle there. And when you engage with growers, um, and they're telling me that they just got their 20th pitch for a precision ag system this season, I I could firmly say that this is probably (laughs) overbaked. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I work pretty hard. I, I usually stay up quite late and get up fairly early. Um, and uh, until somewhat recently, I I don't think appreciated the degree to which sleep and quality of sleep has an effect on output. Um, and uh, I say this on a Friday afternoon, right? <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm reeling from the week I just had and not that much sleep, but but I, I, I'd say that, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago or even two or three years ago um, how much sleep I had, I would probably give you an answer that's, uh, you know, 20 to 40 percent less than what I get today. And I saw no problem whatsoever with that. And today, and now I look at that and go, that was that was foolish. I think we we all probably uh, most humans, at least that I know, need to invest more in, in getting high quality and plenty of sleep. That's a great one. What are you spending too much money on right now? I'm going to, I'm going to zoom out guys and think more societally for a sec. I think we just spend too much money on healthcare. I I mean, I, 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 we have this stat that we put on our website recently. I'll, I'll share it with you. It's we spend more in the United States of America here. Okay. On diet related illness only diet related chronic illness only than we do on all food that we eat combined. And I'm just, I mean, that's just, it's like shocking. So it's a little, a little, maybe not personal to me, but just generally speaking, we spend way too much money on diet related chronic disease. And, um, and I hope that in time we'll have a, a hand in, in helping that. That's a wild stat. It is. It, it's mind boggling. What are you not spending enough on? I'm going to give you a business answer on this one. I mean, uh, we, if I had, if I had another slug of $10 million in my annual budget, I'd put it towards data. You know, crop OS is like a, like a machine that consumes data and creates information that we can action. And we have a, we spend a massive amount of money on data every year. And the, and the, and the arc of data is, uh, you know, scaling rapidly, but, I always, I always say we could spend more on data. (laughs) Matt, as we finish out this section, would love to get um, what you think is your hottest take um, in the food and ag industry. I'm kind of going back to a point I made earlier where you look at the research that this plant-based category is growing faster than we might've even thought. And, And the market projections are actually being ratcheted upward. Um, but I, but I, I want to say what we sometimes get a little bit caught up in is thinking that plant-based works against um, or, or in an absolute manner cannibalizes the, no pun intended, animal protein category. Animal protein, and for that matter, all protein is still growing at a really rapid clip globally. You know, you're talking about an emergent middle class in a lot of countries um, where the middle class is larger than two or three of the United States entire populations. Okay. So the demand for protein generally, purely, totally is increasing. And if you think about, you know, five, five, 10, 25 percent of that total global meat market, animal meat market, um, becoming plant based meat or plant based alternatives, um, it doesn't even mean, even at that degree of penetrance, that those animal protein markets aren't growing as well. So um, I, I'm pointing out a couple of different things here, but 
Um, it, protein, generally speaking, the quality of protein and what it does for our total global health is is not it's not a battle between one uh, one side of an aisle and another. We've got to embrace the fact that we can ad- we can advance and lift up both sides of this. Yeah, I think those are super good points. Well, Matt, this has been a ton of fun. And as we wrap up here, how can our listeners get in touch and connect with you and Benson Hill? Well, BensonHill.com. Um, y- of course, uh, you follow us on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. We do a fair job posting up some updates on the company. Um, for the for the farmers out there, uh, BensonHillFarmers.com. You know, we love to get engaged with like-minded, progressive uh, farmers who who you know are also interested in being a part of our ecosystem. So eager eager to engage with with uh, with all of our stakeholders through any of these means. Matt, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. It's been a ton of fun. Have a great one. So Tim, what'd you think? That was a really fun conversation with Matt. I enjoyed getting his background perspective and really how he, he founded Benson Hill. They've been around for uh, coming up on a decade now. So he's been involved in this space for quite a while. And I just really like their unique business model, um, kind of the the parallel of selling pickaxes and shovels in this movement that is the plant-based movement. And I think a really interesting way to build a business with a growth area like like plant-based. And we talk about regenerative a lot and there's a lot of momentum around carbon markets and just kind of looking at where you can carve out a, a unique niche in those different emerging categories. Absolutely. I remember we talked to a company um, a while back that was uh, supplying lights and technology to vertical farming companies. So kind of same concept of, of really being the core technology behind a booming industry, I think could be very lucrative um, and and a smart business to be in. So it was awesome to see what they're doing in the direction that they're headed. um, And it will be exciting to to follow them along. Guys, really appreciate you listening. Thank you so much uh, for for choosing the Modern Acre to get some some information, some news on the ag industry to learn about how businesses are being developed. We really appreciate that you turn to us, and it means a lot to us. And make sure that you are subscribed, leave a rating and review if you're enjoying the podcast, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>